welcome to another episode of Inside Look. My name is Catherine Gonzalez, multimedia reporter at Inquirer.net. And today, joining us is Dr. Ludo Bravo. She's the executive director of the Philippine Foundation for Vaccination and also the chairperson of the National Adverse Events Following Immunization Committee. Good morning, Ma'am Lulu. How are you? Good morning to all of you. Um, first things first. The other day, Malacanang said that there are now over 1 million Filipinos who have been vaccinated or who have received their COVID-19 vaccine shots. Can you tell us the latest figures or the, la the latest data on the number of adverse events following immunization cases that have been reported to me? Well, ever since at the end of March, we have always seen uh, and uh, monitored all the adverse events that have been reported through the VG flow. It's spelled V-I-G-I-F-L-O-W. It is the app that uh, you is being used in order to collate all the reports of adverse events following immunization all over the NCR and other regions where the vaccination has been started. And what we have seen so far is that uh, the reports for the different, the two, the two uh, vaccines that we have used looked like uh, Sinovac has less adverse events than Astra. In fact, Astra had double the number of side effects uh, that are being reported. And most often these are headaches, dizziness, myalgia, you know, muscle pains, joint pains, sometimes abdominal pain, and sometimes even diarrhea and uh, some sort of uh, fatigue, right? Whereas in Sinovac, one of the top side effects belong to elevated blood pressure. So we don't call it really hypertension because sometimes it really is increased even before you get the vaccine. And uh, we sort of thought it could be associated with anxiety because soon after it goes down the blood pressure goes down. And this is very typical, uh, both young and old alike. Somehow there is a general pattern of uh, getting a higher blood pressure uh, with the Sinovac actually than with the Astra. However, we feel that maybe uh, somehow there is an associated, as I said, uh, anxiety and uh, maybe this is not really uh, only good for uh, Sinovac, but uh, it has also been shown in those given Astra. As far as the numbers, the official report says that for Sinovac, there's about 1%. So if you say there are 100,000 given the uh, Sinovac, then there will be about 1,000 adverse events. That's about 1%. On the other hand, with Astra vaccination, we see a doubling from 2.5 to 3%. So for every 100,000 doses given to the Astra uh, program, we see as much as 2,000 to 3,000 adverse events. So it's double that of the Sinovac. And as I said, I have described the most common for Astra and the most common for Sinovac, right? It's high blood pressure in Sinovac uh, together with some form of fatigue and headache. But for the ones being given Astra, the more common would be the headache and uh, fatigue and fever. Fever too is more common in Astra than in Sinovac. I think it's kind of surprising because before the start of vaccination, people were more doubtful about Sinovac, right? Have you noticed that kind of observation? Yes, actually, um, it changes. What we see actually in the first few months of uh, giving the, uh, no, few days actually, it was only days from the beginning of the Sinovac, which started March 1st, and then the beginning of giving Astra, which started sometime March, uh, a week after, March 7, March 8 right? When we started to uh, do the vaccination for the Astra. 
And what we saw that in the beginning, people were kind of anxious. And that's the reason why perhaps there was this elevated blood pressure, as I said. And what happened was sometime during the month, the report on blood clots, you know, uh, from the EU, from the European Union and uh, the uh, Germany, Norway, you know, those European nations somehow got to be the biggest, hottest issue in town. And people started to fear possible blood clots. And that actually continued up to this moment. And now that we have only Sinovac remaining because the Astra vaccines Already have almost, almost out. been consumed now, right? Almost the 500,000 of Astra have been consumed. And what we now have are the remainder of the more than 1.5 or almost 2 million, right, of Sinovac. First, uh, there was 500, then another 400, then another 1 million. So I think almost 2 million of Sinovac. And there have been already many people, almost half a million or more, who have already received two doses of Sinovac. And truth to tell, there's really a difference in the number of side effects in the Sinovac. But in terms, okay, this is something that we must all pick up and remember so far, based on the studies that we have done. We did not see any unusual events following immunization that could be related to the vaccine itself. There have been serious adverse events, hospitalizations, and even deaths. Yes, that is true. At the moment, we have been monitoring and evaluating something like almost 20, 25 deaths already, both from total from Sinovac and Astra immunization. But the numbers are not so different from the numbers that you will get if you had a group of these people who were not vaccinated, which means there is no increase in the number of deaths that you would expect from those who were vaccinated and the ones who are not yet vaccinated. And this will be through the classified through age. And of course, even the comorbidities or underlying conditions. What we see though, is that um, there have been a lot of cases with even the vaccines, but they have been already incubating or they already are positive for COVID. Because when you test them, they already showed a positive test for COVID. Maybe one day, two days, or three days after inoculation. And some of these were uh, patients or cases who died. And that will be labeled as coincidental or not related to the vaccine, or that you know he died because he had already a previous COVID to start with. Or sometimes there could be, because no, no vaccine is yet efficacious days after being inoculated. So it is possible that even after uh, injection, you might still get COVID up to as much as a month after inoculation, right? Because the efficacy of the vaccine starts, as we know, the 90% for Astra and for the 50.4% uh, for Sinovac starts two weeks after the second dose. So many people, uh, may still get COVID even after inoculation because the vaccine has not yet taken effect. There is no uh, significant efficacy yet of the vaccine. So we, we have to realize that 
you cannot expect uh, protection at this time. And that's the reason why you still have to make sure you do not let your guards down. And uh, mind you, it's always important that uh, we realize that we have to sacrifice and putting on your masks and your distancing and your face shield and your hand washing will always be added protection even for those who have been vaccinated. If your efficacy is only 50% or 70%, you add your mask, your face shield, your hand washing and your distancing, then you reach a higher point of efficacy and prevention from COVID. Yeah. So ma'am, you've explained um, these figures and you said that only a few percentage or only a, a small percentage of the people who were vaccinated actually experienced side effects. But when you go to the ground, when you begin talking to the people, you will still see a lot of uh, people saying or people expressing doubts about the vaccines, about the safety of the vaccine. How can we counter those, those, those doubts that the public still has about the vaccines? COVID pandemic has already killed millions, almost two million now in the world in over a year. And the disease has almost reached how many now? 800,000, almost a million by the end of April. And people have been sick. Even doctors have died. Frontliners have died from COVID. Looking at this, the risk of getting COVID and dying from COVID, do you know, is 2,000 times, even as much as 10,000 times for elderly than getting a severe side effect from the vaccine. And by severe, I would say, uh, you know, the kind of... Uh, severe fever. But one thing about vaccine, it does not show any significant cause of death at the moment. The ones that have been given and almost 1 million doses have already been given. And the way that we see it is the risk of having a severe disease from the vaccine, okay, from the vaccine is almost, almost nil, very, very small. This is the problem. People see the vaccine as causing something like death. When in fact, the death that we see are caused not by the vaccine, but one by the COVID itself, because they got COVID. No vaccine is 100% protective. And we have not even given the second dose, right? So there is very small protection as yet from the first dose. So many people can still get COVID and some have died from COVID. Then you have the small cases that you say had hypertension. And then there are those who died of heart disease. And we know that those people died because they had a previous heart disease. And then, you know, it's not, it's not surprising that some of our young people, even as young as 35, 36, can die from heart disease, especially if they have high blood pressure or if they have not uh, been checking up their chest pains. We have seen those cases. And we are really thinking that maybe this is the right time to check out your heart status before you get your vaccination. So this silver lining that we say is that now you can really check yourself. Yeah, and actually taking off, taking off from that um, thought that you've mentioned, when you look at some social media posts, when some people experience adverse events following immunization, what other people do is they post what they have experienced 
on social media. And some of these people, they already had, or they already have comorbidities even before they have received the vaccines. And then um, the post will go viral. It will be shared. It will be read by a lot of people. But in some cases, after investigation, those incidents posted on social media, it turns out that it's not really caused by the vaccines, but the damage has been done already. A lot of people have already shared that post. A lot of people have already read that post, and it has already sowed fear and doubts among the public. So what's your advice to, to the public about this? What's your advice, um, for example, if they experience adverse effects or even serious events after vaccination? There is the attitude of the people in posting we would things always, immediately in social media. We will always want to say that we need to listen to our experts. The DOH has actually collated, collected, and have been uh, given the chance to interact and also gather around Wow, almost 100 experts now from different fields, not just medicine, epidemiology, even the mathematicians, even the research people, the scientists, they've all gathered together in order to give our recommendations in order to see how we will progress towards getting more people to be saved from this pandemic. The pandemic is really so tough. Everybody knows this has not happened before. This is the first time everybody is experiencing something like this. And to me, um, listening to the experts and helping each other, supporting each other to give clear messages, not to listen to conspiracy theories, to stories that may not sound really uh, it may sound real at first, but when you get down into the details and you ask the experts what this is all about, you might find out that indeed this does not really ring true, that um, there could be some um, underlying uh, kind of incorrect values there or something that uh, has been given uh, without basis, without basis in science, or without really checking with the actual sources, reliable sources. Because in fact, sometimes I would say the social media is so rich in this kind of what we call infodemic, where everybody just wants to chip in and, and get uh, their attention and uh, ask for attention, right? So it's important that we actually examine where this um, news or where these messages are coming from because even our DOH has a regular communication uh, strategies to tell the people what to expect, what our present condition would be and what are the advice there's even a hotline if you want to ask a question all you need to do is dial a number to ask your question so I was saying that it is important for the people to get reliable sources and reliable sources sometimes are coming from let's say the department of health they have a lot of strategies communicating through Facebook, through the Viber, through the cell phones. I think they do give messages. And even on TV, our government uh, health officials are also there to help us. Uh, they explain what needs to be done or uh, what are the things that are uh, going on. And you can ask them a lot of questions, right? During uh, Dr. Ayusek Vergeres, uh, almost daily report. You can have the press people ask their questions. And those are the things I think that could be the reliable ones. Of course, on the website, 
our Philippine Foundation for Vaccination, which has a WHO accreditation for vaccine safety net. You know, vaccine safety is one of the most prestigious uh, WHO accreditation given. And our Philippine Foundation for Site and the things and the programs that we put in there are the ones that would be for the experts to tell our people and to really trust. Of course, the experts coming from the NITAG, the NIFIC, the TAG, the Technical Advisory Group, the FDA, the Vaccine Expert Panel. These are all the experts, the the research. These are all, all the experts, the right information. However, this is something that may be confusing in some because some recommendations would change depending on the existing data, the current data, the data that comes out on a daily basis sometimes. And so we must adjust the recommendation based on the predominating or the, pre uh, or the presence. Of, we might have to adjust recommendations. For example, um, the latest one that we have heard closely into blood clots appearing in those patients given the Astra and the J&J &J vaccine. And in fact, they have asked the U.S. government to stop the giving of J&J, &J, 20 million doses already. And now they are pausing, pausing. Even in it's South Africa, I think. Stopping outright whether these numbers, right, as I said initially, whether the numbers that you see are really quite disturbing that will give you a red flag, a signal that you may be going into a, a big, bigger risk. But then you look at the benefits again, because sometimes this is what happens after the examination, after the investigation, after the real numbers come out. And you will see that the numbers may not really be that huge. For example, when they say there are blood clots in about six cases out of seven million doses of J&J &J vaccine. So it's six in seven million doses. That's even less than one million one in a million, right? And that is really very, very rare. Because if you compare blood clots coming from uh, cases taking contraceptives, for example, the incidence is one in every 100,000. So a case of blood clot occurring after giving J&J &J vaccine, which is one in a million, is going to be so small that they might really decide that you got this one, but you got 999,999 people benefited by the vaccine. And the blood clots may not really be so serious because uh, yes, there was one serious case, one who died, but the rest were still alive. And uh, yes, they, there were some uh, cases who became critical, but again, it's one in a million or even less. So these numbers, if we just deal with the risk and we do not provide and do not consider that the benefits, the 999,999 999 benefited 
by a vaccine and just look at that one case, then, you know, we will never, never get out of this pandemic. And that is a worse situation. And if nobody will trust our vaccines again, that is really so lamentable because nobody can really become safe. Even if some countries have already gotten most of their population vaccinated, like Israel, which has already gone down their incidence. WHO says, no one is safe until everybody is safe. And that's the reason why we have to get everyone helping each other and supporting each other and telling them that it's the vaccine that will get us out of this pandemic. Together, of course, with less transmission being brought about by the use of masks, the facial hygiene and uh, hand washing that we need to do to vaccination. How would you evaluate the pacing of vaccination in the Philippines? Of course, some critics have pointed out in the past that the country has lagged behind or is lagging behind in the deployment of vaccines, even, even on the date when the first, or when the first um, batch of vaccines arrived in the country. Uh, what's your take on this? How would you evaluate the, the pacing of vaccination in the Philippines? We have always feared that there has been a significant decrease in vaccine confidence in the Philippines right after the Deng Baksha controversy. And we knew that, that it has really uh, decreased the vaccine uptake even before the pandemic started. And then the pandemic start, started and it really made it worse. The vaccine hesitancy has risen to such a degree that we in the Philippines is now considered to be the worst in Asia in terms of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence. We talk and talk for so many how we will try to build up the vaccine confidence. I think one way is really to perk up our doctors because they are the ones who can tell their patients, who can tell the people. They are the ones who are most trusted by their patients to really bring about and build their confidence on vaccines. And right now, I can tell you honestly, the doctors, more than 90% of them have already taken a vaccine against COVID. Isn't that great? I mean, if you were to realize this, that even the doctors have already taken the vaccines, why will you not? Because the fear that you might die from the vaccine is rubbish. I mean, it's, it's, it's garbage because the deaths from COVID itself is more than 2,000 times higher than the reports of deaths from vaccine in the US or in Europe. The risk that you will get from taking the vaccine is really, really so small. Then the risk of dying and being hospitalized and spending millions to get well or to recover from vaccine why would you want that? The world is from the lack and deficiency of vaccines. And there's a big demand. And even here in the Philippines, we are still trying to get more vaccines to come to the Philippines. Unfortunately, we cannot have complete control of how many vaccines are coming in. Even the manufacturers are actually hesitant to give us vaccines. Look at what happened to Pfizer. We were supposed to receive 115,000, but that was withdrawn. 
And up to now, we don't have the promised Pfizer vaccine, which yeah. we were ready to, which we were ready to actually get, isn't it? To receive. But suddenly, no Pfizer vaccine. And the news was that the company wanted so many paperwork, so many indemnification. They want to be saved from liabilities. They want to make sure that the government will be the ones to shoulder any liability because they're afraid that because of the scare, because of the experience that, you know, maybe Sanofi has now been um, kind of in the hot seat, it might happen also to the other vaccine manufacturers that will be getting vaccines to the Philippines. So that is one disadvantage that we now have. If we can only support each other, help each other to build that confidence, we might find ourselves better able to get the vaccines that we want and also to get a higher percentage of person, of patients to be vaccinated or our country could achieve bigger, bigger uh, herd immunity in the future. We will have uh, within a year, if that is what was promised, that we may get at least more than 100 million doses. And so we might get 50 to 60 million to 70 million people with two doses. That will be the day. That will be when we can say that, okay, uh, we may relax a little, but not until then, not until our country become more confident in getting vaccinated and this is really going to support not ourselves alone, but also our family. We have to do this, not just for ourselves, but also for our families, our communities. The, the best vaccine is the one that will be available to you. Don't, don't cry for something that's not there. I mean, don't pray for something that's not there. Don't ask for something that's not there. The one that will be available to you, that will be um, appropriate for you, will be given by the vaccinator, by people who will screen you, which one will be most appropriate for you. And that has been studied. That is based on what the present scientific data has. So it's important that we actually have a good uh, memory of all of the things that uh, our experts are saying, diba? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Lulu. Your final message for to our viewers. I have always told our people to trust vaccines. Long, long time ago, I have worked with vaccines vaccine trials. I've done so many in the past 35 years of vaccinology, giving children and even adults vaccines. I have seen and inspected and investigated adverse events. I have been part of a safety monitoring board that looks into whether or not you should continue vaccinating for those clinical trials. And I know for a fact that when these vaccines are approved for use by the experts, passes through the long, tumultuous, and very meticulous experts who look at these vaccines, they are being given for you to save lives, to save not just life and limb, but also the community. And now with the COVID, it can save the country. So this is the final message. We have to trust vaccines. And your doctors will tell you that. 
they have already taken the vaccine. Why shouldn't you? Isn't it? Isn't it amazing that you will not trust your vaccines when your doctors themselves have already taken the vaccine? So that is it. This is our messages always. There is a need for us to trust vaccines because vaccination saves lives. And the best vaccine for COVID is the one that will be given to you as the one appropriate for you.